the Catholic tradition, we emphasize that there are names given to the persons of the Holy Trinity that are proper to each of the persons, for example, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But there are also terms given to God that are common or essential to all three persons. For example, we speak about God's goodness, His power, His wisdom. These are all in some way applicable, or they can be applicable to all three persons. The Father is all-powerful, the Son is all-powerful, the Holy Spirit is all-powerful. And so likewise, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are wise, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are good and loving. But appropriation is that practice which is already in the New Testament and then is practiced in a robust way by the fathers of the church and analyzed in the scholastic period in some depth by which we ascribe fittingly certain essential terms, terms common to all three persons, to one person in particular. Examples are very clear. We could talk about the eternal power of the Father or the Father as the one who is eternally omnipotent. Uh, we could talk about the eternal wisdom of the Son as the Son who is eternally wise, or the Holy Spirit as the eternal, uh, one who is eternally good, the goodness of the Holy Spirit. Well, uh, the conundrum then follows. Each of these persons possesses this essential uh, perfective term that's proper to God as God in its fullness. So why are we calling the Father powerful, or the Son wise, or the Spirit good? And uh, the theological question becomes, why is that fitting? That's, that's appropriation. Why? Because those terms can be designated of each of the persons, but we're appropriating them to one person. And to this um, question, you can give the following answer, which is a simple um, analysis Aquinas provides. Yes, it's true to say those properties are inherent in each of those persons equally as God. All three persons are omnipotent. And in addition, when the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit act exteriorly, they act as one principle. So, for example, it is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who create the world in their omnipotence. It's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who redeem their world in their wisdom and goodness and so forth. Nevertheless, in the activities of God, the effects of God, you could say, there are ways in which some of those effects manifest more perfectly the Father, Son, or the Holy Spirit as distinct persons even though all three persons are acting together. And the right use of the appropriations can designate how the effects of God more perfectly reveal a given person for a reason that's fitting for Trinitarian uh, reasons or because of the mystery of the Trinity in and through their common activity together. That sounds very abstract, but let me give a simple example. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit create in omnipotence as the one God who's all-powerful. But in that act of creation, it is the Father who creates through the Son and in the Holy Spirit. And the Father is appropriately named as the principle of creation because he's the principle of the Trinity. He's the one from whom the Son proceeds as wisdom and the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son as love. So when we think about God creating and we appropriately designate that as an act of the divine omnipotence, only God can create because only God is omnipotent. It's not unfitting, it's rather appropriate to designate the Father, who is the principle without a principle in the Trinity, as the origin of the Trinitarian act of creating in his omnipotence. Uh, even though it's also the Son who creates and the Spirit who creates, but it's the Son of the Father and the Spirit of the Father, and so we can say the omnipotent Father has created the world. And it's a more, in a way, appropriate expression of revealing who the Father as Creator is, um, if we say it that way. Just as we can say, in the same kind of logic, the Son is the wisdom through whom all things have been made. Well, the Father is also wise and the Spirit's wise, but the Son is the eternally begotten Word of God, the intellectual expression of truth and knowledge through whom God has made all things in after whom he's modeled or patterned all things in his divine wisdom. So it's appropriate to talk about him as the wisdom through whom all things were made. And we can talk about the Spirit appropriately as the goodness uh, of the God, the divine goodness through whom all things have been made, that God has given the world being as an expression of love and as a gift of being, uh, eternally proceeding from the Spirit who is eternally good, the goodness of the eternal Spirit who is love. Even though the Father is good and the Son is good, is good eternally, so the Spirit is eternally good. But there's a certain appropriate uh, designation of the Spirit as the principle of goodness from whom the world comes forth. So 
um, this is both numinous and intelligible. It's a, a way of alluding to the mystery of the distinction of the persons and their shared common essence. And it's extremely important because using appropriation, we both designate monotheism, Trinitarian monotheism, that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are the one principle with a unique and shared identical divine power, goodness, wisdom, etc., and the real distinction of the persons of the Trinity the, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the way that we can manifest uh, better through various kinds of speech this real distinction of persons. So appropriation is at the heart of Trinitarian discourse, and it's a very beautiful, uh, deep, uh, numinous dimension of Trinitarian theology, but also one that after time with study we can make great progress in understanding.